Hey, how's it going? Time to get started. Uh, call the meeting to order. Let's start with roll call. Commissioner Allen? Present. Commissioner Norwood? Here. Commissioner Siragusa? Here. Commissioner Roberts? Here. Commissioner Stallings will be in later this meeting. Commissioner Orr? Here. And Mayor Pankinen? Here. All right, thank you. Uh, item two, at the commissioner's request, discuss any item of concern from the regular session agenda. Okay. Uh, seeing none, we'll move to item three, study items. 3.1, update on public safety software purchase for the police department. Good evening. Hey. Not sure if everyone knows me, I'm Scott Miller. I'm the assistant chief. Uh, we've been using the same records management dispatch software at the Indian Police Department for over 24 years, almost 25 years now. Over the past, we've uh, looked at updating it two or three times, never could get under a million dollars. It was always way up there. Here, uh, a few years ago, we met with the uh, seat commissioners who wanted different types of stats. Um, our current software that we're using now, there was no way we could come up with those stats. We, every time we'd run them, they'd come up different because our records management software is not where you're easily to search and get the records out. It's not, they're not made for that being it was so old and they haven't been updating this software for several years. Uh, so we started looking at, uh, Chief Skaggs had gone to a couple uh, conferences where there were some vendors for software. So we reached out to those vendors, asked them if they could come and give us some demonstrations. Uh, we got uh, two demonstrations, one's from uh, Central Square, which is a, an app-based uh, software, and then the other one was Tyler Technology that they came in and gave us a, uh, a uh, demonstration. Both of those were very outstanding companies. Uh, they did above and beyond anything that we have, been, we have seen and we could do with our current software. With our current software, we, right now, the Indian Police Department, we re, uh, send information to state and national crime data bases. Uh, our current software that we're using is not set up to do that, so we actually had to go out and purchase a different software program that our records girls has to put that information in to one software program and then turn around and put it into a different software program to send it to the state, which then goes <coughs> on to, to the federal government. We also have a mapping system. It's a different software program because our current one, they wanted $1,000 a car a year. Well, we got 80 cars out there right now. We'd be paying $80,000 a year just for the mapping software. We went out and got a cheaper version. The new software, that's all integrated in. Um, to show how important this software program is to the police department, not just administration, which is it's very important, but to the officers. We budget $500,000 a year for new police cars. That's all out, upfitted. 
And the reason we do that is even right now we're 20 officers down. That means that we have 80 officers driving police cars. Our units get usually at least 20,000 miles a year on our uniformed officers. At 10 to 12 cars a year, which is what $50,000 gets us, an officer is driving his car for eight to nine years before he gets a new one. At 20,000 miles, you're looking at 160, 170,000 at least on those. Now, on admin cars, on detectives cars, we don't put near as many miles on them. So in the middle there, we try to swap some of those out to keep them lower mileage. So getting new cars for our patrol guys is very important. <clears throat> but when we started talking about getting a new software program that'll do what we want it to do, every one of them got excited. Every one of them said, we can forgo cars. I'll drive my car for next year. That's how important a new software program is to the police department. From the officers to the sergeants, lieutenants, all the way up to the administration. We all use it for different things. So we took bids. We got three bids back. Tyler Square being the app base one I mentioned, uh, came in at $640,000. $140,000 is actually what we budgeted. It's $102,000 a year, which is uh, right now we're spending around sixty dollars to $80,000 a year for the maintenance and everything. So that's also about a $20,000 a year increase. Uh, Tyler Technology, uh, 190,000 higher than that. And the Stoles who did not come and give us a demo. We really don't know much about their software. I've called, I've talked to their, their techs. It sounds like they've got a good product, but wouldn't respond to come to give a demo. So, but they still did give a bid for over a million dollars. So, uh, and they did not give the yearly maintenance. And I requested that specifically, so they were on there because they were our third bid. Uh, we got these two bids out. I went around and talked to the officers, the ones who sit through both demos. Everyone there said, even though Central Square is the cheapest, they all thought that was a better product for what we needed. The report writers, the ones that's out taking up evidence, this software will do it all. I'm going to give you a, an example here of what we do with our software as a patrolman. Something easy. We have vandalism. Someone throws a rock through the window of store downtown. Officer shows up. Currently, he gets his $100 camera out of his back of his car. He goes over and takes pictures of it. He seizes the rock, puts it in his car, takes the report. He goes back to the station, gets on the software, types up the report. He takes the brick into another room, tags it into a separate software program for evidence, gets it all out. He then goes in and downloads the film, the camp pictures, off the camera into a different program, and then finishes up his report, and then he goes back into service. With Central Square, and the guy told me that if we go out to the car, out to the same crime scene, the officer can take out his phone, log into the Central Square app. When he takes a picture of that brick, it automatically puts it onto our server at the police department. That's one step, one set of software we no longer have to use. He says, then you can take the brick, and even on your phone or on your tablet in your car, or you can wait till you get back to the station, you can describe that brick in your report, and it's back into the server at the police department. So all he's got to do is walk back into the second room, hit the print button, it'll print his sticker out, he puts the sticker on the brick, sticks it in the locker, and he's back in service. The guy who jokingly said, you could write the report on your phone if you wanted to, but most people want a keyboard. And I said, well, I know I've got some of those young guys out there who can type faster on their phone than I can on a keyboard, <laughs> you know, and with a lot less mistakes. So, um, but this is just one thing that, like I said, it'll do our evidence. That's a separate software program. It'll do our report writing. Here a few years ago, we've tried to streamline our report writing and make it easier, paper free, which everyone knows that you can't do that. But so 
but it's not, our current system's not user friendly. This software, and I, me and uh, my IT guy went to Mustang, which was the very first police department in the state to uh, use this software, to actually get this software. The lieutenant down there now actually helps teach nationwide how to use this software. When we were down there visiting him, he got a call from the Atlanta, Georgia Police Department because they had, were having some issues with this software. He answered their question over the phone. They were all pleased and ready to go. Stillwater has just gotten the so same software. Bartlesville has the same software. Uh, the uh, lieutenant from Mustang was giving us some tips on putting our own forms into this program. We can put every one of our forms that we have into this software. And when we type it out and we print it, it all comes out just like whatever form we want to use, including the DPS accident form that uh, the state uses. It's already on there. The lieutenant from Mustang didn't really like their version, so he wrote his own because in this software you can write your own modules. So there is a couple uh, areas that I questioned was a, the, like an FTO program. The FTO program, they don't have because he says, the salesman said everyone's FTO program is differently. But you can write your own in this software. You can make your own modules. I asked about animal welfare. You can write your own well, animal welfare module. You can write whatever module you'll want and it, you can make it fit this software. So one of the issues that we've had recently that it's been an ongoing problem is trying to get the district attorney's office all the paperwork they want on calls, on our reports and our cases that we are sending to them in a timely manner. There's also a module for prosecutors that we all we have to do is click a box after we get done with our case, click a box, they automatically have access to it using the app. So they can do it from their desktop. Uh, when we send this out, so I do a report. I'm, a, I'm an officer. I do a uh, stolen bike report. When my report's done, I hit a box. It automatically goes to my supervisors for approval. It's that simple. It's, and if I want records to get it and the detectives to get it or whoever, it's just one more box I have to click. They automatically get notified that there is a report that they need to pay attention to. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. If you look here, this is kind of what we use now or what they offer all on their one software program. Our report writing, our records management, our evidence, which is currently a separate software program. It's already NIBRS and CYBRS certified. There are certain types of crime <coughs> that we're required to report to the state and to the federal government. Those are the ones I was telling you that after our girls up front and records get those reports, when they come in, they have to re-enter all that information into a different software program. This software program's already certified. So when it comes up, and if, it, if I'm typing a report and there's something that's required by the state, the software program won't let me go to the next page until I fill that in. So everything's complete by the time we get it done with the report. And according to the Mustang Lieutenant, it didn't take his guys very long to realize what information they had to have to meet those guidelines for the federal government and the state government. It didn't take them long. And that's the stuff in the past that we were having trouble searching on our current software. Because our software didn't take it, that's why we had to get Otis, which is the software we're using now to send to the state completely different type of software. Our 911 dispatch. This is all integrated the same software. Also goes to your, your phone. Our cars have tablets. Um, if a 911 call comes in, it'll come up on the screen and their, their units, why, where it's coming from before it's actually ever dispatched. As soon as, as soon as the dispatcher starts typing it, it'll pop up in everybody's car. So if I've got something out at uh, Walmart and I'm eastbound and all of a sudden it pops up, I've got a shoplifter at Walmart, before they even dispatch it, I'm doing a U-turn going back toward Walmart. 
I mean, so it's integrated like that. The mapping system is um, what they described, I think, uh, the fire department, I thought was uh, what they told us about the fire department's part of this was actually spectacular to me, is they can actually map out their uh, fire hydrants to within just a few inches. Hmm. So if they come up, the fire department is dispatched, they would actually be able to look at their screen and see exactly how far that fire hydrant is from the address they're going. So their mapping is supposed to be that, that precise. Uh, the mobile and the field application, that's what I was telling you, that it's all an app. So you can pull it up on your phone, you can pull it up on your tablet, um, your desktop. Uh, with it being an app, we can also make sure who's using it and what device they're actually using it on. So just because an officer has access and he wants it at home, we get to decide if they get it to have it at home or not. We can cut it down to exactly who gets what access and how much access they ac actually have. So we can make it where the DA's office are only getting the cases we want them to get. They don't have full access to everything. If the county wants something, we can give them access to whatever they would need in the, in the same terms, is we can give them just what we need to or what we want to give them. Officers have all, will have all this out in the field. Administration, our training, our administration, like our, uh, one of the things that I do is track complaints on officers. I track use of forces, uh, injury to offer officers. I track uh, automobile car crashes, our units car crash. I track all that. I, I get the reports and I put that into a database. This will have its own database. So if I'm at home some night and I get a call from a lieutenant who's doing an investigation on an officer and says, well, I need to find out if this officer has been uh, in trouble before. I'll be able to pull it up at home and look at that. And anything that I think he needs access to, I'd be able to give him access to that. So that's something on the administration uh, part of it. Personnel. Right now we have a current uh, system. We have a training personnel. Basically it just tracks whatever they put into it is how much training they have. Well, we can actually dial that down to where it'll track more, it'll do more for us. We can have it actually connect to other parts of things that people would be able to input stuff and it would go into their system. If I take a, a class and I put it in there and this hit the button, it'll just notify training that I just took this class, my certificates in my training personnel, my uh, training file, then go in, look at it, make sure that's everything they need and move on. They don't have to make copies. They don't have to scan them and send them places. It'll all be right there. That's why I'm excited <coughs> about this software. If you go to the next one. This is a video, just a short video. I think this is the one of the lieutenant out of Mustang. I think it's two, maybe three minutes. Kind of explaining how excited they are and everyone else that's basically kind of has used this uh, software in Oklahoma. So um, this is the lieutenant that me and uh, uh, Tom Watts went down and, and spoke with and he, uh, he got extremely excited that we were even thinking about using it. He said it is a good tool and it cuts out hours a, a month off of officers' activities. Man hour use is just phenomenal. Scott, I have one question. Yes. The uh, thing that's different about a verbal vacation? Accident. Yes. You have a rest report, you have your accident report, and all of that. Is this going to integrate just putting in that one name, the when one you took, time like When you put one? the information in there, and then you go over and pick out which forms you want, it puts all that information into whichever form. So you could actually print off five forms. It's going to put all the information that you entered once into all five forms. That's That would knock out hours upon hours yes. of they actually of have writing. a jail and a smaller agency modules that they could actually purchase that would actually integrate with ours if an officer down on, on a traffic stop and scans a driver's license and that information is automatically put in there he doesn't have to type it it's already going into the system 
Uh, it also integrates with our digit tickets that we already have. So that's all in there. There's also already a, uh, a uh, interface with the current software that Tyler, I believe, the city uses, I believe, Tyler Technology for their, their software. There's already integration to get that information on citations and arrests to the city clerk, clerk, clerk's office also. And traffic runs through multiple highways to the town, so you have to be very intelligent about the routes that you take to get to calls. Knowing where those calls are before you get there, you'll make a different decision on whether you're going to go one way or another, and you'll save time on that. Now, with ProSuite, from the moment that the call comes in and that information is automatically brought in with the interfaces, a lot of times, before the call even comes out, officers are already in the field and we have audible alerts set up so they know that a call is coming out in the past. So you knew where a call was, you could be driving away from it. But now, as officers may be driving away from it, they already hear the sound of a call coming out and they're reading it and they're actually going to drive to it, making call times more efficient, but also gives them more opportunity to do the other things where they would be having to spend overtime before. So time saving starts way before the call even begins. Our old system was massive with data redundant. Anything that was put into dispatch, we had to duplicate it on the report side as well. With ProSuite, we don't have to do that. It takes everything that's on there and it's brought over into the case automatically, which enables the officer to go in and add the things that need to be added for a case, as opposed to have to start from scratch as they would before. Previously, we did manage our own server and it was antiquated. Crash went down all the time, I mean, unreliable. Uh, you come in the next day and someone will be like, oh, by the way, I couldn't write a report 12 hours ago because the server went down. My worry is how do I help the officers get what they need to be done? How do I make sure that they have the customized forms in the system that they need to work through their calls? And then we're not even thinking about that part. That was a huge part of why we ended up choosing ProSpeed, because having that on site and having that help, I, I don't even think about that part of the equation. He was calling it ProSuite. Uh, what ProSuite is is basically the, all of the modules together into one is what he was calling ProSuite. That's their dispatch, that's their records management, that's their report writing, that's their mapping. The whole system is called ProSuite, which is what he was calling it. Um, like I said, we budgeted 500,000. Uh, we had a meeting with Aaron. Uh, we're 140 short. Uh, we're working on uh, some ways to make the other 140 up. Uh, personally, I feel that this is a, a game changer for the police department in time management, in tracking of statistics, which uh, in today's society, everybody wants accurate statistics. Um, I'll be able to look at it and I will personally be able to run searches, say if someone calls in and says, how many accidents you have at this intersection? I should be able to come up with that information within five or 10 minutes. You know, how many times has this alarm gone off at this, false alarm gone off at this business? I should be able to, from my desk or actually probably from my phone, I should be able to search that and within a few minutes come up with that information. Uh, some of the things that, that are, we have had problems with in the past is bad information. Officer gets a report and they give them an address, phone number, whatever they put in the system. You, we can set it up where an officer can't just go in and use the old information and, and paste it over. So we're always getting that same information. We'll set it up where they have to ask for an address and a phone number. So we'll have current information every time. And when we pull that up, if I'm doing a search, the most current information that was given, of course, we have to depend on getting that information from the citizen. That's how we do it now, but the most current that they give us will be what comes up, the, up at the top where you don't have to worry about, well, they've been using that same address and phone number forever. And they can't go past that unless they put that information in there. And that includes anything that we want to make and set it where they can't, they have to put that information in there before they go forward if it needs to go to the state or the federal crime stats. So 
Are there any more questions? How, mu how much training? How much training is required for you guys for the officers to learn how to use this program? Is it yeah. fairly easy or is it intensive? Uh, or what I have been looking at, and and uh, they actually come come here. They uh, Central Square actually will set up a team, and they'll come here to get it going, and they'll actually set up a training database, and we will put officers and trainers through that, and. Uh, according to their contract is they'll stay here as long as we would request them to stay here. What the Lieutenant told me was make sure you use that training because there's one major agency in the state who didn't accept the training. They just had them download the stuff and tried to learn it off YouTube and then sent them on their way. You're talking about they spent, they did the entire agency, they spent over a million dollars for theirs and then they did they let them walk away. Well, they're not happy with it. And the trainer, the lieutenant from Mustang says, because they didn't take any of the training, he says, I'm on the phone with them several hours a week trying to teach them over the phone on how to do stuff. He said he's even gone down there and tried to teach some of their trainers how to use it. So he said, if you use their trainers when they're here, he said, after you learn, it all kind of integrates together. So after you learn one part of it, it kind of, goes along with everything else. Is It's not like trying to learn it all at once. Is because when you do one thing, it's exactly the same way to do the other entries. So, but they'll stay here as long as we need them to stay here to train our guys. Sounds good. Hey, did, and I was looking, so it looks like the total quote was uh, 640 some thousand dollars. Yes. Now, I don't know how this was presented to you guys, but we've got a first year maintenance and a first year subscription of about uh, 86 and 15,000 so that's about an extra hundred is that included in the uh, 640 that no it's not it's the first year yes that is that that's why it gets paid out that first year uh, is my understanding okay so we're looking so, at so are we looking at 640 plus 101,000 so 750 all together be about 102 my understanding the way he, he explained it to me is that first year is all encompassed to everything that we buy. Okay. So, and the reason that that yearly is on there, and the reason they put it <laughs> first year, and I had them explain this to me, is because they do first year, which Tyler didn't, but Central Square did the first year because it's liable to go up with everything else each year, and this is a one-year contract and not a multiple-year contract. So he said in year two, it may be 103, 104. And he said that's how everyone's is unless you purchase something multiple sure. year for the same price. Okay, so the total is really about 750-ish. Is that, uh, I reading that correctly? That would yeah. be, the 640 would be up front okay. and the 120, the 102 yeah. is at, at the final when everything's released. It takes 12 to 18 months to get it all up and running. Okay. Okay, so we're so we would be in the next budget. So that'll be a bill down the road. Yes. Okay, and then and then that's it. There's just first year maintenance and, and subscription. After okay. that, there's no cost. The hundred two would be every year. Every the year. yearly recurring costly every the year. year. Yeah. Right now we're paying around seventy to eighty thousand dollars a year for everything that we use. Okay. It's so it is a little higher than that, but it does a lot more. But it's offsetting you guys' time and effort. And, yes. Okay. By lots. Well, let, let me interject. We should have gotten rid of the software we have now five to ten years ago. It's been obsolete. It hasn't done what we needed to do for a long time. Um, but, of course, the money is always an issue, just like with everything else you guys deal with. Um, when we looked at this, we decided this was more important than buying 12 new cars next year. Um, it did come in $140,000 over what we estimated. Um, I feel like with some deletions we can do in our current budget, we've got a car that's probably never going to come in. We're going to get down, uh, get the offset down to about a hundred thousand, and I feel like um, if we can't get that into this year's budget, we've got the fund balance, we've got the money in there to cover that extra hundred thousand. So yeah, no, I have no objection to it. Well, you don't, you don't have to sure. sell it to me. Yeah. I just, I was just curious. I mean, and then I'm probably hitting you guys on the spot with this question, but. How many man hours do you guys think it'll save you per year? Um, just roughly, I don't know. Well, you take eight hours a day of our records personnel entering double entries, cut that in half. Cool. 
it would be easier for them to stay on top of things because they have a tendency with the amount of calls we take to get behind. Yeah. And uh, that's just going to lessen the amount of time that they're spending on the computer double entry. Perfect. Thanks. Appreciate it. That, uh, I was going to say, <laughs> just based on my question that I asked Scott and knowing how long a DUI crash plus arrest takes, if all of this information goes on the arrest report, the impound report, the accident report, plus your affidavit and everything else, that's probably just in one case scenario, save six hours. And, and another thing this does is it's a case management system. And one of the problems we have right now with the district attorney's office is when we submit a case, um, let's say you have a homicide, that investigation is not completed within 48 hours like they show you on TV. It, it's ongoing for weeks. And guys take reports. We're having trouble getting, making sure the district attorney's office gets those reports. What this program is going to do is create a case file where everything's going to go into that case file. We hit a button, it goes to the district attorney's office. Um, so this has got a lot of um, <laughs> capabilities that we don't currently have that we're trying to figure out solutions to. Um, and that goes to your question, is it going to reduce man hours? Absolutely. By a ton. I see this also reducing possibility of human error with re-entry. Well, I, I think with any <laughs> software system, bad information in, bad information out. <coughs> with the fact that this audio auto populates, I think that's going to reduce that over the course of time. Yeah. Uh, I had a couple. It would appear to me that the common thread through all this is efficiency and getting the officer back out in the field where he can do some good instead of pushing a pencil. Especially when you're 80% manned. They don't tell you that when you we, become a police officer. I know. But if you're 80% <laughs> manned, this is a way to be able to better use the 80% you actually have to do 100% of the work. I mean, well, I was going to touch on another thing from my experience with second sheets. How many times second sheets get lost with this system that you have right now? This will do it all within the software system and attach and it, it to the case. And it should attach, so if right. you're assigned a case, you should get a notification. When you, get, when you do a second sheet, there'll be a box on there for case agent. You click that box, and whoever is assigned to that case will automatically get a notification that there's a, a new entry. So he'll be able to go into it. One of the things I didn't bring up on the evidence part of it, which was, uh, is while I am out in the field and I pick up my brick from my, my uh, vandalism, I can actually go on the website and see which lockers that we have over there are open and actually can reserve a locker. So I'll, I'll even know what locker I'm going to be putting the brick into when I get in there. And it'll say reserve so when the next officer goes in to try to get it, he can't even get into it. I mean, it's that specific. Uh, did you ask him? Okay. Um, do we have to maintain the current system? Is there some way that it'll archive the information? Say, say you have a, a homicide okay. today, so and you got evidence do, it's all entered. Uh, we used to have a system called Flex. Yeah. When we went to ITI, which is now Omnigo, yep. uh, we had a transition period. Yep. Um, what we're going to do with this is we're going to able, be able to archive that on a server. That information will still be there, but what we want to do with this software is new data in uh, so it's good data right. and with the way this auto populates uh, like uh, Whitney said or Commissioner sorry <laughs> said yeah. earlier uh, the efficiency and the correct information that's going to help us with all that okay yeah that's why you're still going to have access yes. to we'll that. still have access to all okay. the old we own the search module for our records management <coughs> so we'll get to keep that we'll still have all the data so we will still be able to search everything we already have okay uh, second point, um, $140,000 short. Um, I sometimes think of things in a business perspective, and one of the things contractors do is they take their time about hiring additional employees because that lapse all becomes part of the budget that they can use. If we're 20 officers short, and if they made 40000 a year, that sounds like 800000 a year that is not being spent on personnel right now. So it seems like there should be some room in there to be able to help. <laughs> uh, Aaron and I have had that conversation, and we're looking at more operations than personnel as okay. to make up the difference. All right. Mm -hmm. But just 
have to uh, sometimes think of the way we come from. I'm always thinking a way to get yeah. more money. So. <laughs> all right. <laughs> That's all I had. Does anybody else have anything? Okay. Thank Thanks. you very much. Good presentation. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, item 3.2, Call Lake Water Supply Program Financial Update. Wonder who that could be. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. It's been three whole months since we've done this, so we're going to just update you on where we're at on numbers, um, same types of information that you've seen in the past. Um, we're five months in of collections from the 1% sales tax dedicated to Call Lake and Water Supply Program. Um, we have collected 4.275. Um, so far this year, that is an increase of 4.85% over last year. Um, when comparing that to the budget for this year, we budgeted a little over 4 million for the first five months. So we're at 6.33% over budget on collection so far this year. In total, since the inception of the sales tax, we've collected $51.7 million in sales tax. Um, we earned interest of just under $600,000, which brings the total revenue for this fund to $52.3 million. Um, to date, we paid $30.7 million in loan payments against the five loans that we have for the Call 8 program, and that leaves $21.5 million that is in that account as of today. Um, of that 21 million, 20 million is invested in T-bills that are laddered against our payments in um, September and March of each year for the next two years going out five million in each of those four tranches um, the two newest notes that I just purchased last month are earning 4.732% and 4.629% respectively that's better than it would have been in the past yes the, oh. the other two notes that we have that we hold and at the time it was great rates were 1.37 percent and 1.79 so significantly more but it's um, what matches up to what our next payments are hmm. status of where we are on loans um, again still the SRF loan for 2018 is fully drawn and the 2016 FAP loan is fully drawn um, of the 2018 FAP note, there was a $44 million note. We have $12 million left to draw on that loan. The 2019 FAP loan, nothing has been drawn. That will be the last um, loan that we do draw down from. And so there's $51.9 million <coughs> remaining in that bucket. And then the 2020 SRF loan, that was a $205 million note. <coughs> We've now drawn down 102.6 million, so about 50% of that note has been drawn down to date. So overall, we um, have drawn down in total 170 million, with 166 million left to be drawn. So we're at 50.54% drawn of all the loans for Call Lake so far. About halfway there. This is just um, the same exact slide as last time. We have not made any payments since the last time that I did an update for you guys. So we still have the 334 in origination loan amounts um, with 324 principal outstanding. And you see the breakdown of the 30 million that I've said that we've made in loan payments. How much is principal interest and loan origination fees on each of those? And then the last slide here is the Call Lake budget status. A little bit of change on this since the last time. Um, we have to date had actual expenditures on the program of 185 million. We have another additional 148 million dollars encumbered, and we have a remaining budget this time of 212 thousand um, dollars. That's a little higher than last time. We had about 66,000 remaining in the budget at the last update, but since that time, we've done some cleanup on the realignment where we had had some dollars encumbered for some of those parcel owners on the realignment that we've since canceled, so it's freed those dollars back up into the budget since the last update. Is there any questions on the call, like financial status that I can up answer for you guys tonight? Well, I'd just like to make a comment. Aaron, you do an outstanding job in putting all this together. I just want to thank you for doing what you do. Appreciate that. Anyone else? Would you just update them on the Call Lake Oversight Committee that's going to meet later this week, I think, that Commissioner Stallings is a part of? Or maybe you already did. I, I, 
Yeah, no, yeah, the Call Lake Oversight Committee meets um, quarterly, and their next meeting is scheduled for Thursday at noon, and we'll give them the same update of information on where we're at on all of the funds with the Call Lake program. And Dan Randall is the chairman now, is that right? No, uh, Wade, Wade Patterson okay. is the chairperson, and uh, Dan Randall is the vice chairperson. Um, Wade will be absent, so Dan will be running the meeting this week. I know Dan came up earlier this week and had a conversation with you, so he's yes, he doing did. his due diligence. <laughs> he, he did. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. No other questions? Thank you. Uh, item 3.3, engineering update. Fair hey, commissioners. Uh, I just got a few slides to go over this evening, just a couple of projects to get everybody kind of up to speed on them kind of where we're at and then answer any questions that anybody may have. Um, the first project is, <coughs> excuse me, is Chestnut Avenue uh, between 10th and Davis over there. Currently the project is about 75 overall, 75% complete. Um, they're working on completing uh, portions of the roadway um, between uh, uh, 10th and, uh, da sorry, 12th and Davis, 11th and Davis, yes, sorry. I get confused over there with the Davis Street. Um, the next project is, uh, is East Birch Avenue over uh, between 16th and 23rd. Uh, the the con contractor's been working on it for oh, approximately 60 days or so, and they're about 35% complete. Uh, currently, they're at uh, 16th, or they've, sorry, they've completed 16th and Ferguson, to Ferguson, and they're currently working uh, along uh, uh, Ferguson and 18th. They're, uh, constructing sidewalks and, and is finishing up the street. <clears throat> um, Oklahoma Bridge, uh, never ending project it feels like to me, but uh, we've been working pretty hard, they've been working really hard on it here the last uh, month or so. Uh, approximately 85% complete. Uh, the main structure of the box and everything is completed. Um, they've they've made, had to, we had to make some adjustments to uh, some of the flow lines and, so, and things like that uh, to make things uh, work correctly. Uh, and they're putting in the backfill uh, currently, and they will start putting in the roadway once they get done with the backfill. Their goal is to be laying concrete over Christmas. So hopefully when they get done with the concrete, we should be looking at approximately another month or so of that actually being closed uh, before it gets wrapped up. Um, Leona Mitchell project, Leona Mitchell water line project, um, they're right at about 60% complete. Um, I think last time I did a, I did a uh, presentation on this, I believe they were like to here, now they're to here, which doesn't seem like a whole lot, but uh, in the meantime they've been uh, putting in a lot of loop lines, uh, six inch and two inch that, that are wrapping, kind of getting this project into a nice, nice situation to where we won't have as dramatic of shutoffs as we've been having, of, you know, basically the whole addition. So uh, things are like that are, 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 are hopefully kind of coming towards an end. Riley, do you remember when the next shutoff is scheduled? Is it after the first of the year? I think fe January or February? Yeah. Um, so there'll be, there'll be some more shutoffs coming up as they continue to wrap it up. Um, but uh, I believe the, they've, they've nearly completed all the uh, additional loop, uh, service lines, loop lines, and, uh, and then they'll finish up with the main when they go through there. Uh, I think that's my last one. Yeah. Any questions on any projects that I talked about or anything additional? I have a comment. Yes, sir. The shower really feels good over there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, the volume is up and you can tell the difference. Good deal. I good. mean, a big difference. Good. So thank you to all the councilmen that voted on that, the city of Enid, <laughs> and everyone that's doing the work and the contractor that's doing the work. Thank you to everyone. I'm, I'm able to enjoy it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's wonderful. It makes you want to pay your water bill. <laughs> well, you should thank that lady that showed up with the water that looks so dirty. Yes, <laughs> you're right. She's the one that got us turned around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. All right, good. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate thank you. it. Okay, item 3.4, update on the master trail plan. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, just giving you an update on what is the current status of the trail master plan. Mm -hmm. um, like, I'm uh, going to provide you an uh, objective of the trails 
and uh, what is the total wash master plan is and uh, how much we have completed so far and what is the next phase we are evaluating currently and goal. The objective is to provide trail northeast, west, south connection and provide quality of water life, quality of life. You see, it's about the This is the total master plan of the total city of Enid with the trails. We have some link trails, bike trails, dirt trails, it's all encompasses. Uh, the red here shows the existing trails. That's about 12 and a half miles currently we have completed. Uh, the uh, 2006, we adopted, uh, city adopted the trail master plan, but in about like 70 years, we got Quite a bit done. Um, the next phase, we got four phases we are currently working on. So this is the prairie view that's currently in the budget this year. This is the Cleveland Trail, Cleveland Street, that is part of the Cleveland widening project that goes from railroad track to Willow. Mm -hmm. And right here is the Garland Road and Randolph. That trail goes from Garriott to Randolph on Garland. And this is the Vance Air Force Base Trail that goes from, uh, like, we this year we completed up to uh, Norman Road, not Norman, Richland. 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 Yeah. So this portion completes from Richland all the way to the gate of the Vance, Vance Air Force Base. So these four trails together are almost 2.7 miles. Uh, like three of the trails, they are being designed completed, and uh, this portion, it's under design. Mm -hmm. Next conceptual phase, this is basically like connecting north and east parks, like Med Lake Park to Cross Lane Park. This, we are still evaluating this portion of it, sorry. This portion we currently evaluating. This is this is not part of the original master plan. The original master plan uh, looked into several other options. Uh, this one feels like serves better because it co connects two schools. So we are looking this option uh, in the next year or so. This one leg and the next leg. It connects the Cleveland and Willow to. Crossland Park right here, so along Willow. So these are the two legs we are working on. If we complete those two legs, it will connect north and south. Morelli, mm -hmm. do you mean that we're designing those now, or? No, sir, okay. we are not, but like they are not in design. This is a concept, we don't have budget yet. Can you go back to the, where you were showing Prairie View and uh, the Vance Trail? Yeah. Those are two pieces of the trail that we've recently submitted for grant monies for, right? That's right. Those projects are over a million dollars each. Yes. And so we've asked for a lot of money from ODOT. Stephen, our grant writer, has recently submitted that. You did a lot of work on that. Um, we're very hopeful. I don't know what the timeline is on uh, getting the, the, the answer on that, but I know that Prairie View specifically is one commissioner war that you and I have talked about before and, and maybe some others. And I know Vance has been talked about for a long time, so I'm I'm very hopeful and pleased that uh, uh, we've submitted that, those monies in the transportation uh, alternative program at ODOT, and I'm guessing that we'll get at least one of those funded. I would be very disappointed if we didn't. Right. So, not, not I'd be disappointed in ODOT, no. but I think we've submitted good um, information on that, so I'm, I am excited about that. Um, Garland you're talking about will come when the road gets widened, right? Yep. And so will Cleveland. Um, which is coming pretty soon. In fact, there's a contract for the railroad yep. work tonight on the agenda. <clears throat> okay. I, I think I'm, I'm the one that kind of shook the tree on this. And yeah. I, I want to, uh, to make sure that at our, each of our budget years, uh, at our budget, when we come budget time, that we keep this moving. Mm -hmm. and, and the north-south movement, I think, is important because that's where we're lacking today. We have no way to travel north and south. Uh, we've got lateral 
movement that's good but we need to we need to make sure that we get some north south movement in there so i encourage you guys to uh, to i know it's a long drawn out process and it'll probably take longer than i'll be here but um i want to keep this trail system going and and complete it and because it's the one thing that people really enjoy in this city is is being able to to yeah. to get on those trails and ride bikes and <coughs> exercise and so yeah no, very good so morale on that uh <clears throat> where you showed the red lines where the existing trail is now this is an odd question but i mean it doesn't it doesn't show where it goes across the core drainage channel there uh, between. Uh, I didn't know if you could insert that red or not. Right there, sir. Is that what that is? Yep. So that takes us into the park? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. Um, I thought it was there. That's the spot I thought it didn't connect. Is that a bridge or is that is that, that pedestrian bridge we put in, the low right. water bridge? Right, yeah. Okay. Right here, yeah. Okay. So this is Mid Lake Park right here. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Really could you point out where the downtown area is? Because I just want to see what our plan is around right downtown. So right, right now, currently downtown has a lot of sidewalks. That's right. why it's not showing any trails right here. Okay. We built those sidewalks 10 foot wide so they would match. Yeah. And, and Broadway was the best street to go down. <laughs> and, uh, and it took us right to the smack dab middle of the university. So a lot of people don't realize that that's part of the trail system, but it is absolutely part of the trail system. It's all handicap accessible, and it's a great stretch of concrete, you know? Yep. Good. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks, Morale. Appreciate it. Last video. That is a video. So. Yeah, we got a, a, a video that I think is entertaining that oh, quickly great. shows you what we have, and I think, Mayor, you star in it. Uh oh. Another extension to our uh, trail system, and I can't believe it, but you know what? We're not done yet. Just check this out over here. That's where we're going next. We're going all the way to Southgate and all the way to the Gate Advanced Air Force Base. I couldn't be happier. Come on out, bring the family, have some fun, and I'll see you on the trail. Happy trails! <laughs> That's a good film. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Item 3.5. Discuss uh, designating the mountain bike trails as a city park. 
and yeah. there's a resolution there? Gonna yes, that. Dana, could you pull up the resolution, please? Uh, Mr. Saragusa, I think you might have asked for this one, I think. Or? Yeah, I asked this to be brought up uh, due to the fact that we can get a lot of outside funding if the trail is actually designated as a city park. As it stands right now, we're losing money because we can't apply for certain grants and certain issues that can come in. So this is the reason why I brought up the mountain bike trails. Um, Chief Skaggs can go in a little bit further. He's been doing this for about 12 years now, I believe. Uh, we're, I think, year five. Well, year five, for, but this has been going back at least 12 years at been in discussion and in the works of making this something bigger than what it is at the moment. So, um, yeah, about six years ago, we really got serious about having mountain bike trails in Enid. Uh, I sit down with the Parks and Rec Department, Gerald, and several others uh, to try to find a location. And uh, Tenth and Roop is where we settled. It's the old landfill. Um, when we got there, it was nothing but weeds. And uh, we've got that knocked down. We currently have eight miles worth of trail. Um, Rob Houston has jumped on board with us. Uh, we've got a couple videos out of the mountain bike trail for um, that goes out for recreation uh, and bikers to come to Enid. And uh, what precipitated um, the park resolution is the mountain bike, I'm sorry, the BMX group would like to come to Enid and do something. And they were looking at our, our what we called a park. I had to get an address when I started it. I got the address, I just didn't realize we didn't do anything to make it a park. Um, so I'm learning as well. And uh, they won't even look at Enid unless it is a designated park. Well, that could bring some revenues to us um, that could add on to, I'd like to see that as a whole bike park complex, um, similar to the rail yard or some of the stuff that they've got going on in Bentonville. That's my ultimate goal. Uh, the bigger goal I have is to connect it into our other trails. Um, of course, that all takes a little bit of time. So uh, I'm learning. Uh, I thought we had this done five years ago. We did not. It came up when the mountain biker or the uh, BMXers wanted to come here and look at putting uh, a trail system in on some of the land we have available and uh, they called and said uh, that's not a park and I said yes it is and they said no it's not <laughs> and so that's why this came forward and uh, Keith brought it forward to you guys to, um, for the resolution also we can't apply for a lot of grants unless it is a designated park by the city now this won't change anything as far as what we do. We maintain the park. Everything that's been built out there um, has built, been built with our own money. Um, we've done it ourselves. Uh, I won't say that Parks and Rec hasn't come out and helped us because they've jumped in where we've fallen short. Uh, but we try to maintain that ourselves so it doesn't put an extra burden on uh, the Parks and Rec's department. So that won't change. It's just a matter of having that designation so that we can apply for grants and we can get the B, uh, BMX people in here to look at that area for some additional trails and some additional entertainment for our citizens. I will say the park naming resolution is pretty straightforward the way I read it, is that if, it, if it, it's really the commission's desire to do this, it talks about an application and a fee, but we can waive the fee. It doesn't make a lot of sense to pay ourselves. Um, we can do the application. It talks about going to the park board I think we could do that probably as soon as a week from now. I think I've think i actually got that scheduled for the next meeting. Okay, perfect. And, and then we could bring it back to you guys for action if that's your desire. To do that, it's pretty simple. I'm not sure. What, what, what would we call it? Was it? It's 580 Trails 580. is what it's been named from the, the get-go. I would hope that we keep it the same because that's what's on all of the marketing that's on our street signs on Garriott and 10th Street. It's on our logos. It's on our T-shirts. So I hope we would keep uh, consistent with that okay yeah so i think we can start working that as soon as next tuesday and then perhaps bring it the next council meeting so yeah i'll, I'll be I'm, I'm with keith on that i'm behind that 100 percent. i think uh in fact i think i've asked you periodically to get these uh i know they've got a 
handful or two handfuls of volunteers out there they're spending their own time and their own money making that trail better and it's used by everybody in the, or you know anybody in the city can go out there so I think it's I think it's a great idea and so we can start looking for some grant money or, or city money to throw out there and really improve that that bike trail out there I think that's a great asset I would like to add that Stephen uh, who the city brought on as a, a grant writer has a, done a phenomenal job he called me about a grant we've already applied for it one thing we don't have is a lot of equipment uh, we do everything by hand, uh, so we put in for a four-wheeler, a sprayer, a tractor with all the implements. So Stephen did all that. He's done a great job. He's been a great help to me, so I just want to give him kudos. Good. Chief, is, is there a building out there on location? There is not. There's not. I have a Connex container that we have wood uh, that's been donated by Star Lumber and some of the others uh, that we use to keep the trail updated and make sure it's safe. Um, but we don't have an actual building. That's something we'll look at in the future. Yeah, I will say, uh, Commissioner Orr, I just, I, know, I see Corey in the back, and I know we have, I think we've been pretty proactive, Brian, working with you. Corey has. Absolutely. Trying to help maintain and spray and things, and I'm sure we'll even get more active when we designate it as a park, so. Well, we just don't want it to be an extra burden on the parks and recs, so we, we try to do all the maintenance, so. Uh, like I said, they've jumped in and helped us with the spraying, providing some of the chemicals. Uh, so it's been a partnership, but like I said, I just don't want to be a burden. I, I want to do this for something to do for our citizens. It's no cost. Anybody that's watching, it's for the public. It's open 24-7. Uh, the only time we do close it down is either for maintenance of the trail or inclement weather. Otherwise, it's open. It's free. We do have a donation box if you'd like to help out. Fuel's expensive right now. Um, but other than that, it's free to our community. So I think we'll move forward and talk about it at Park Board, and then likely it'll be on the next agenda for you guys to take Sounds action. That's good. Yep. <clears throat> All right. Any commissioners have any other questions? Okay. All right. That said, uh, we're done. We will. Can I can we go back yeah. and revisit number uh, two real quick on uh, item number 6.1 for the YWCA? For the air conditioners, it says that that's not, it's not budgeted. Do is that part of CBG? Well, that was at the last meeting. CBG. We were supposed to do that, but then it didn't get something didn't happen right. So now we're bringing it back. We're a pass-through organization for that money. Okay. So that's like CARES Act money or something, and then it goes through us to them for their air conditioning system. We gave another one away at the last November first or whatever <clears throat> meeting. It is in the budget. It is. Yeah, the, the CB2 money is budgeted in the CBG okay. department, right. so it's yep. yeah. already accounted for. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any others? Okay. Uh, let's, uh, we'll break it up here and adjourn and reconvene at 630.